The Christian Hell from the 1st to the 20th Century by Hypatia Bradler Bonner, 1913. Chapter 7, 19th Century. The pronouncements on hell from the pens of certain notable ecclesiastics living within the last 50 or 60 years are scarcely less remarkable than those already cited. Dr. Pusey, Regis Professor of Hebrew and Canon of Christ Church, Oxford, was probably unequalled among Church of England divines of his time in his command of descriptive language. The following specimen is from a sermon upon everlasting punishment, delivered before the University of Oxford on the 21st Sunday after Trinity, 1864. Gather in your mind all which is most loathsome, most revolting, the most treacherous, malicious, coarse, brutal, inventive, fiendish cruelty, unsoftened by any remains of human feeling. Conceive the fierce, fiery eyes of hate, spite, and frenzied rage, ever fixed on thee, glaring on thee, looking thee through and through with hate, sleepless in their horrible gaze. Hear those yells of blasphemous, concentrated hate, as they echo through the lurid vaults of hell, everyone hating everyone. Elsewhere, he says that they who deny eternal punishment as inconsistent with the attributes of God do not really believe in the same God whom Jesus revealed. In 1879, Dr. Pusey published a book which in a very short time went through several editions entitled What is of Faith as to Everlasting Punishment? in reply to Dr. Farrar's challenge in his Eternal Hope. In his advertisement or preface, in speaking of the number lost, Pusey quotes Chrysostom's opinion that among so many tens of thousands in Constantinople at that time, you would not find a hundred in a state of salvation. Without actually endorsing this estimate, he is anxious that the possibilities should not be underrated and the terrors of hell underestimated. He himself believes literally in everlasting fire and argues that, if we know anything at all, we know that the doctrine of everlasting punishment was taught by him who tried to save us from it. He speaks mournfully of Farrar's book as one of unhappy popularity, and in quoting a common saying that the fear of hell peoples heaven, he remarks, I dare not myself lessen any terror. Perhaps millions have been scared back from sin by the dread of it. He declares that no one has yet been found to doubt that the mass of Christians have from the first believed the future punishment of the lost to be everlasting, and that the denial of the doctrine involves the terrible blasphemy that he did not foresee the effect of his own words. John Henry Newman, first vicar of the Church of England and later cardinal of the Church of Rome, gives a fearful and vivid picture of the judgment. O oh, terrible moment for the soul, he exclaims, when it suddenly finds itself at the judgment seat of Christ, when the judge speaks and consigns it to the jailers, till it shall pay the endless debt which lies against it. Alas, poor soul! And while it thus fights with the destiny which it has brought upon itself and those companions whom it has chosen, the man's name perhaps is solemnly chanted forth and his memory decently cherished among his friends on earth. Men talk of him from time to time. They appeal to his authority. They quote his words. Perhaps they even raise a monument to his name or write his history. They speak of his greatness, his great mind, his great oratorical powers, his excellence, or say that he was a benefactor to his country and to his kind. But, O oh vanity, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profiteth it? What profiteth it? His soul is in hell. O oh, ye children of men, while thus ye speak, his soul is in the beginning of those torments, in which his body will soon have part, and which will never die. If this is the fate of the great, the worthy, and the benefactor of mankind, how can Christians pretend that a belief in a future state of rewards and punishments is an incentive to morality? Newman even pictures the lost soul as having been a Catholic from a child and dying in communion with the church. But even that will not save him from the flame and the stench 
of his church's hell. Father Faber, also a convert to Roman Catholicism, was the author of a book entitled The Creator and the Creature, or The Wonders of Divine Love, which has had considerable popularity, and part of which was republished as a booklet, The Easiness of Salvation, in 1896. He is one of those curious persons who see an awful beauty about the kingdom of eternal chastisement, an austere grandeur about the equity of God's vindictive wrath. There is no class of Christians, he says, to whom hell is not an assistance. The conversion of a sinner is never complete without the fear of hell. Salvation is so easy. One confession at the hour of death, and the soul that has spent close upon a century of sin is saved, saved because God puts the requisites of salvation so low. A little later in his book he asserts that there may be many in hell who have committed a less amount of sin than many who are in heaven, only they would not lay hold of the cross of Christ and do penance and have easy absolution. There is no life of self-denying virtue, however long and however laborious, but if it ends in mortal sin, must be continued among the unending pains of hell. Samuel Wilberforce, Lord Bishop of Winchester and Prelate of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, preaching on sin, pictures something of the blackness of that darkness, something of the horrors of that pit, in which ever new and ever overmastered rebellion gnashes in the hopeless agony of eternal despair, which, he says, is the fate of the finally impenitent. O oh, awful sight of unequalled horror, he cries, when he who, created by the loving will of goodness infinite, sees in perfect retrospect that his doom of endless misery was self-chosen, self-inflicted, self-formed in his own spirit. In a sermon addressed to boys and girls at their confirmation, Bishop Wilberforce is even more definite. The poet, the statesman, the orator, the scholar and philosopher, the moralist, the disobedient child, the careless youth, were each in turn described as standing before the judgment seat and deceiving themselves still, until the delusion was dispelled forever by the words which bade them depart into the lake of fire. As a piece de resistance, the young candidates were told of a schoolgirl cut off at the age of thirteen or fourteen. In her short life she had sometimes played the truant, sometimes told lies, and had been obstinate and disobedient. Consequently, she is cut off from heaven and from hope, and henceforward dwells among the worst of men without any spark of human feeling, without any restraint on their desperate rage. Lost angels are there in torment themselves and instruments of others torture exulting in the misery of their victims and perpetually increasing their anguish. The drunkard they seized and tortured by the instrument of his intemperance, the lustful man by the instrument of his lust, the tyrant by the instrument of his tyranny. This was the teaching of the bishop to the boys and girls placed in his charge. In another sermon, Bishop Wilberforce tells the story of a young man of great promise and of much simplicity of character and excellence of life, dying in darkness and despair, because he had ventured to doubt whether the sun and moon stood still at Joshua's bidding. Among the preachers of the nineteenth century, few painted hell in more vivid and fearful language than Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was own spiritual brother in descent to his Catholic contemporary, Father Furness. From the earliest years of his ministry to his latest, he loved to make play with threats of the wrath of God, and to terrorize the faint-hearted into submission. In 1856 he preached a sermon on heaven and hell in the open air at Hackney to an audience said to have numbered 12,000 persons. In this sermon, which was republished in New York in 1857 and translated into French and issued at Toulouse in 1858, he drew tragic pictures of the hopelessness of the damned, their anguish and pain, the mutual recrimination of friends and companions, of mothers and daughters, of fathers and sons. In another discourse, delivered about the same time upon death, a sleep, he addresses his hearers thus. If ye were to depart, we might indeed take up a very bitter cry. We might ask the owl and the bittern, with their dismal hootings, to assist our lamentations. We should have need to weep for you, 
not because your bodies were dead, but because your souls were cast away into unutterable torment. O oh, sirs, if some of you were to die, it would be your mother's grief, for she would bitterly reflect that you were shrieking and gnashing your teeth in fell despair. She would recollect that you were beyond the reach of prayer, cast away from all hope and all refuge. O oh, poor soul, what a sorrowful thing to bid good-bye for ever, one to descend to endless flames, and the other to mount to realms of everlasting bliss. When the iron gate of hell is once closed on our lost friends, it shall never be unbarred again to give them free exit. When once shut up within these walls of sweltering flame, which girdle the fiery gulf, there is no possibility of flight. We recollect that they have for ever stamped upon their chains, for ever carved in deep lines of despair upon their hearts. It is the hell of hells that everything lasts there for ever. There time never mitigates woe. Hell grows more hellish as eternity marches on with its mighty paces. The abyss becomes more dense and fiery. The sufferers grow more ghastly and wretched as years. If there be such variety in that fixed state, roll their everlasting rounds. Then the tortured ghosts are sport for fiends, and the mutual abradings and reproaches of fellow sinners give fresh stings to torment, too dread to be endured. This well-known passage from his sermon on the resurrection of the dead would be difficult to surpass for thrill and poignancy. When thou diest, thy soul will be tormented alone. That will be a hell for it. But at the day of judgment, thy body will join thy soul, and then thou wilt have twin hells, thy soul sweating drops of blood, and thy body suffused with agony. In fire exactly like that which we have on earth, thy body will be asbestos-like, for ever unconsumed, all thy veins roads for the feet of pain to travel on, every nerve a string on which the devil shall forever play his diabolic tune of hell's unutterable lament. Spurgeon taught implicit belief in the infallibility of the scriptures, and in a discourse upon this theme delivered at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, in 1888, he warned his hearers emphatically that it was of no avail to argue God is love, and therefore he will not execute the sentence on the impenitent. He has not left us inferences. He has spoken plainly and pointedly. He says, He that believeth not shall be damned, and it will be so. If you draw inferences contrary to what he has spoken, you have inferred a lie. Your unbelief in eternal judgment will not alter it, nor save you from it. He had no sympathy with those squeamish Christians who are anxious to cool the fires of hell. The popular acceptance of the justice of the relentless and indiscriminate vengeance of God is vividly expressed by Mrs. Hermans in her Vespers of Palermo, Act 2, Scene 3. Montalba, let the venging sword burst forth in some free festal hour, and woe to him who first shall spare Raymond. Must innocence and guilt perish alike? Montalba, who talks of innocence? When hath their hand been stayed for innocence? Let them all perish. Heaven will choose its own. Why should their children live? The earthquake whelms its undistinguished thousands making graves of people, cities in its path. And this is heaven's dread justice. Aye, and it is well. Why then should we be tender when the skies deal thus with man? Why should men be tender when almighty God deals thus with man? Horatius Bonar, a Scottish Presbyterian divine, was a great hymn writer and devout servant of God. He was a prolific writer of religious literature, and nearly every hymnal contains a selection of his hymns. The following specimen shows that he does not lag far behind that other popular hymnologist, Dr. Watts, in the fervour with which he depicts the condition of the lost. Descend, O sinner, to the woe, thy day of hope is done. Light shall revisit thee no more. Life with its sanguine dream is o'er. Love reaches not yon awful shore. Forever sets the sun. 
Call upon God, he hears no more. Call upon death, tis dead. Ask the live lightnings in their flight. Seek for some sword of hell and night. The worm that never dies to smite. No weapons strikes its head. Descend, O sinner, to the gloom. Hear the deep judgment knell. Send forth its terror-striking sound. These walls of adamant around, And filling to its utmost bound, The woeful, woeful hell. Depart, O sinner, to the chain. Enter the eternal cell. To all that's good and true and right, To all that's fond and fair and bright, To all of holiness and light, Bid thou thy last farewell. Christian Maxims, or Tiny Flowers of Ours, is a little book specially prepared for Catholics and consists of a translation of selected thoughts of Monsieur Vianney, Curé d'Ars. The copy before me was published in Dublin in 1887, Permissu Superiorum, and had the cordial approval of C. A. Reynolds, Archbishop of Adelaide. The translator says that these selected thoughts have the pith odour and essence of Christian perfection, and they may be read and considered with facility, pleasure and profit. They are certainly rather quaint. Take, for example, one of the selections from chapter 4 on the Holy Ghost. Take in one hand a sponge saturated with water, and in the other a stone. Press them equally. Nothing will come out of the stone, but out of the sponge you will force water in abundance. The sponge is the soul, filled with the Holy Ghost. The stone is the heart, cold and flinty, where the Holy Ghost dwelleth not. From chapter 7 on the priest, After God the priest is everything. Leave a parish twenty years without a priest, and it will worship beasts. From chapter 9 on sin, He who lives in sin assumes the habits and the forms of beasts. From chapter 10 on hell. Hell has its source in the goodness of God. If you should see a man set up a large pile of wood and heap up the faggots one upon the other and then asking him why he should do this, he would answer, I am preparing the fire which must burn me. What would you think? And if you should see the same man approach the flame of the burning pile and when it has blazed up, precipitate himself headlong into it, what would you say? In committing sin, that is the very thing we do. As a bird flies up to the ceiling and then falls down, the justice of God is the ceiling which attracts the damned. From chapter 12 on the hope of heaven, we have two secretaries, the devil, who writes down our bad actions in order to accuse us, and our good angel, who writes down our good actions in order to justify us on the day of judgment. The devil deserts us until the last moment, as we desert a poor man while the police are coming to arrest him. When the police come, he cries, he struggles, but they don't let him go for all that. These puerilities are actually sent forth to the world under authority and expressly approved by a Catholic Archbishop as the essence of Christian perfection, which it will profit the faithful to read and consider. In the middle of the 19th century, we see the beginnings of that great open revolt within the churches against the infamy of an eternal punishment for sinners. Expressions of disappropriation had long been heard in private conversation, but the clergy of all denominations had kept a practically unbroken front towards the public on this and other important but hard sayings of the founder of their faith. Those who disbelieved in a hell of everlasting torment, and there were many, either pretended belief or else maintained a complete silence. But at last the day came when the silence was broken and the mask of pretense torn off. The dramatic story of the Essays and Reviews is admirably told by Mr. A. W. Benn in his great work on English rationalism in the 19th century. Professor Roland Williams' contribution, a review of Bunsen's Biblical Researches, was specially singled out for condemnation. Under his treatment of the atonement, the fires of hell are spiritualized into images of distracted remorse, while heaven becomes not so much a place as fulfillment of the love of God, 
Mr. H. B. Wilson, the moving spirit of the whole church, contributed an essay on the National Church, and he also was specially selected for attack. In the course of his argument, he urged that if salvation is determined by belief, either in the Calvinist or the Catholic sense, it is incredible that the conditions of salvation should have been revealed to so few. And finally, in a passage full of dignity and pathos, he ventured to suggest a hereafter where all, both great and small, shall find repose or be quickened into higher life. Bishop Wilberforce, whose public allocutions upon hell affirmed the fullest belief in its reality and its justice, but whose private opinions are said to have been even more advanced than those of the contributors to the essays and reviews, castigated the volume in the Quarterly Review, preached against it at Oxford, and induced the whole Episcopal bench to join in a collective denunciation. Professor Williams and Mr. Wilson were prosecuted for heresy in the Court of Archers, and were suspended from their livings. They then appealed to the Privy Council, where the judgment was reversed by Lord Chancellor Westbury, under whose ruling the eternity of future punishment was declared to be an open question. The Archbishops of Canterbury and York, who sat on the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, dissented, and Lord Westbury's judgment was so obnoxious to both the High Church and the Low that Dr. Pusey, acting on behalf of both schools, drew up a declaration expressing belief in the verbal inspiration of Scripture and in everlasting torments, which was sent round to every clergyman in England, Wales and Ireland, accompanied by a letter entreating him to sign it for the love of God. The declaration obtained 11,000 signatures, which were one perhaps less by the love of God than by the fear of man. The prosecution of the essays and reviews, followed up by Lord Westbury's enlightened judgment, gave a great impetus both to rational thought and to the practice of honesty. As time went on, candid criticisms of the dogmas of the churches were expressed with a freedom hitherto confined to sceptics, and almost unknown among Christians. In these pages we are solely concerned with the doctrine of eternal punishment, and when Archdeacon Farrar proclaimed his repudiation of this as cruel and horrible, he was only expressing the feeling which was widely held by the best minds of his day. Inside and outside the churches there was growing up among Christians an increasing perception that eternal punishment was morally indefensible. The consequence of all this has been that less and less has been said from Protestant pulpits upon the subject of hell. The silence became so marked and so general that we find on the one hand a zealous churchman like Gladstone asking what place in the ordinary range of Christian teaching is now found for the terrors of the Lord, and expressing his fear that there was great danger in this disuse of the instrument of persuasion which St. Paul had thought so necessary. And on the other we have Dr. R. W. Dale, a highly esteemed Congregationalist divine, also commenting upon the general avoidance of the appalling revelations of the New Testament concerning the wrath to come. The appeal to fear, he says, is being silently dropped, but the menaces of Christ mean something. The appeal to fear had a considerable place in his preaching. It cannot be safe, it cannot be right to suppress it in ours. The clergy, of course, were and are in a great difficulty. Everlasting punishment is no doubt horribly repugnant to civilized minds, and impossible to reconcile with the idea of a God of love and mercy. But it is not only explicitly taught in the New Testament, it is absolutely essential to Christianity itself. This was very plainly put in a Lenten sermon preached by the Reverend Dr. Strickland, vicar of St. Saviour's Hands Place, when he asked, Is it not a fact that the fall of man, the atonement, the personality of the Holy Ghost, repentance, saving faith, conversion, are denied one after the other by unbelievers in eternal punishment. And that's the end of a lengthy chapter 7. Thank you for listening.